Well, if that is not adorable, oh my goodness. Uh, Happy Mother's Day, moms. Uh, We love you. We are thrilled to have you in our lives. And uh, man, uh, you are a treasure and a gift from God. So uh, we just want to say thank you. And thanks for all those who uh, shared memories uh, through uh, like the pictures and the videos of, uh, of special moments or special memories with their mom, how uh, wonderful it was. I hope uh, for each one of you, uh, husbands or um, fathers of kids, also kids, make sure you're giving uh, lots of hugs, lots of, uh, lots of kisses, and lots of uh, good mornings and happy Mother's Day to uh, your mom all day long. Make sure she feels the love, and uh, if you were extra prepared, uh, you would have picked up your uh, Mother's Day bag, so uh, you'll want to give that to her. Uh, if you haven't done it already, give it to her after service, and just tell her how much she's, uh, she's loved and how much she means to you, so make sure she feels special today. Well, this morning, we're going to be uh, continuing our series in the book of Philippians, and uh, just continuing to, uh, to feast on God's word. But it's interesting that the, the, the passage that we're going to be looking at today is very appropriate in the lives of our, uh, ourselves, in the lives of our, our moms, and just uh, giving them an opportunity of how they can continue to pray uh, for change in their kids. Uh, our series that we've been going through is uh, called Always Finding Joy. And that's the theme of Philippians. Always finding joy in every circumstance, in every season, the highs, the lows, the difficult times, always finding joy in Christ. And one of the ways we find joy in the people of God and and the people God's put in our lives is through praying for them. And and it it brings great joy to our own hearts, and it also uh, bestows and brings great joy into their lives as well. And so uh, this morning's title is Pray for change. Pray for change. And I have uh, just uh, been wowed this week by how powerful prayer is. Uh, how many of you know that prayer is powerful? Anybody? Yeah, do you, do you know it at home? That prayer is powerful. Um, it, there's something about prayer. It is a, a uniquely holy encounter in the throne room of the Almighty that believers get to experience. And, and, and as majestic and as wonderful it, it, as it is, um, sometimes I think we miss it in the mundane stuff of life, right? We miss the majesty of the moment because of our mundane lives and, and, and the stuff going around. And, and I remember back in the beginning of January, we did a week of prayer. And, uh, and during that week of prayer, we were coming and gathering at the church every single night for at least an hour, hour and a half, and just calling out to the Lord, learn, learning about different things. And, and um, there was one prayer specifically by one of our elders, Andy Lewandowski. He led us through this great teaching on prayer and then guided us into prayer. And I, can I just be honest in church? Um, it's, it, it's, it's usually a good thing to be honest in church. Um, when... When we started praying, he had us pray in January for doctors and nurses and medical workers. And this was the first night of the week of prayer. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, this is the weirdest way to start a prayer meeting. I, and, and, I'm, and I'm feeling a, a little nervous and I'm thinking to myself. And I, I, but at the same time, I'm mature enough in my faith and I've, go, I, I've been walking with the Lord enough to know that my plans and my opinions don't really, don't really matter when, it, when, it, when, when we think of what God is doing in his plan that he's working. And now standing a few months later, thinking back that in January the Lord knew that there was a pandemic that was going to overtake the world and who was going to be on the front lines caring for the people and, and, and ministering to the people and working hard in the midst and risking their own lives even for the people, it would be the doctors, the nurses, the medical workers, and those in the healthcare industry. And, and how, <laughs> how awesome and how powerful our God is to be able to just like in a uniquely holy moment go, I'm having you pray for things you don't even know are coming. And, and that's how awesome prayer is. That's how powerful prayer is. And can I tell you, man, how, how many of you feel that, that we need more power in our families? We need more power in our, in our homes and in our marriages or in our kids or, or in, 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 our, in our workplace. We need the power of God at work. And so I want to encourage us to pray for 
change. That's, that's what Paul is praying in our passage this morning. He is praying for the change in the Philippians. Not because he's all annoyed with them and he's like, ah, I don't want anything, but because he longs for their joy. He wants them to experience the gladness of God that, that is not dependent on circumstance, but is rather based on faith. That says, in the midst of the most difficult circumstances, most horrific times, I can find joy in Jesus. And so he's praying for change in the life of the Philippians for that very thing. So if you have your Bibles, and, 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 and I hope you're grabbing your physical copy of God's Word, man. There's something in a pandemic and not being able to be with people. At least you can, at least you can hold God's Word and touch God's Word and smell God's Word and even... This morning, we're going to spiritually eat God's Word. So if you got, got your Bibles, New Testament, uh, the letter to the Philippians, chapter 1, starting in verse 9. Listen to Paul's prayer. He says this, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let's begin with this point here this morning. And, and it comes from the, uh, the main verb, the main challenge, the main clause of this prayer. It is this, pray for change in the ones that you love. That's the theme of, of, of Paul's prayer here. Pray for change in the lives of the ones that you love. Pray for their change. How many, uh, how many would be honest with me in church and just say, it's easy to get bitter uh, sometimes, right? It is easy in life when you're dealing with people, when you're talking to people, when you're spending any amount of time, it's easy just, to, just for your heart to get bitter and to grow. I mean, sometimes you're just frustrated with people, the way they act, the way they don't figure things out, or you get annoyed at them for their little idiosyncrasies and their quirks, or, or you're, you're exhausted by them and just like drained by them. You know, they walk into a room and you're like, man, I feel a sucking noise as people are coming closer. And you're like, or maybe you're just discouraged going, like man this is not the way right and you, anybody ever felt bitter I mean it's easy to get bitter especially when we're looking at the immaturity of people right and and we see the immaturity or the flaws of other people right a am I right moms any can I get an amen is it, it, it yeah okay a couple moms in here how about moms at home am I right it's easy to get bitter sometimes I mean a even this week Max uh, was uh, was sitting down and he's needling his sister and he's going after her and just bang rah, 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 and, and he's just like annoying her to no end and finally cast like knock it off right and you could just see like and, and of course like Max is not alone you know the apple doesn't fall far from the tree right because uh because uh, where's he getting it from? He's getting it from his, uh, you know, dear old dad, right? You know, like, it, one thing you don't know about me, probably, church, is that uh, my wife tells me all the time, he, she's like, man, you have junior high humor sometimes, <laughs> right? Like, the jokes that I'll make with my wife, or the way I want to joke with her, she's like, I don't, I don't find junior high humor funny. It's not funny at all. And I'm like, so disappointed, so disgusted, but she's like annoyed at my immaturity, Right? I, I, I've, got a, I've got one elder on the elder team who loves, uh, loves you know, just kind of sending little jokes. We were joking about some, uh, you know, some crazy movies that we remember from our childhood. Right, right Doug? Yeah, junior high humor, right? But, but for everybody else around us, we think it's awesome. They are like, it's annoying, right? So let's go back to the point. Pray for change in the ones you love, right? Here's the thing. Paul is praying for the Philippians. He's praying for them, and he has every right to be annoyed. He has every right to be bitter about them because, man, he invested his life. He gave them a great example of the gospel, and he spoke the gospel. He, he was the founder in, of their faith in the sense that he came and shared the gospel, and they accepted it, received it, and came to Christ. And so he leaves to go work on planting another church, to go starting another church and ministering the gospel just like he did in Philippi in another area. And a little later he finds out that there's, there's fighting in the midst of the church. There's, there's competition in the midst. There's, there's disagreements and, 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 and there's, um, there's, there's people who aren't caring about their witness before the world. And there's people running after false teaching. And, and, and Paul should be like, what are you doing? Who are you? I don't even know you. 
and yet he doesn't. What does he do? He prays for them. He takes that burden before the Lord. And here's the thing that Paul learned. You cannot be the main holder and the main carrier of another's growth. Did you know that? Did you know that this morning, that you cannot be the main or the sole carrier of another's growth? Sometimes we want people to change, right? And we're like, man, they need to get it. And, and some of us go to ent- uh, lengths and, and degrees just to, just to communicate that and make sure that they're changing. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll tell them, we'll tell them strongly, we'll tell them super strongly, we'll melt down sometimes trying to change other people in our lives. And, and, and God never had it for us to try and control, to try and change, to try and mess with the life of someone else. That's not our, that's not our plan. That's not our calling in life. And, and you're not the sole, uh, sole carrier of another person's growth. And so for some of you, it, maybe, maybe you codependent ones who are like, man, I, I, I've got to change this person. I've got to go after this person. Man, maybe you need to just lay off of that for a little while. And maybe you need to just start to labor in prayer for that person. Because as we labor in prayer, we give that thing to the one who can truly care for them. And it's interesting here for the Apostle Paul, he's just demonstrated how much he loves and, and just spoken how much love he has for the Philippians. And, and that's really true because, but because for us, if we're going to pray for people, you ever wonder why your prayers for other people don't, uh, don't happen? Maybe you're not an intercessor, and that's not your spiritual gift, but your intercessory life in general is very low. And you're like, why is... Can I tell you, there's a lack of love there. Because you have to love enough to care for somebody. I love what it was said, what what Richard Foster said in his book on prayer, and specifically the chapter on intercessory prayer. He says this. He says, if we truly love people, if we truly love, like Paul did, to to yearn for them, to hold them in our heart, to be connected to them. If we truly love people, we will desire far more for them than is within our power to give to them. And this leads us to prayer. See, here's the thing. If you love someone so much, if you desire their good, if you long for them to know the joy of the Lord, you're going to realize at some point, I can't bring them further in their lives. I can't bring them to this place of joy that I want them to experience. I can't help them to have the same emotions, the same connection with Jesus that I do. Like, there's a stopping point. And at that point, that's the point of prayer. That's the point where you recognize helplessness and you go, God, you're needed here. God, you are mighty here. God, would you be attentive here? So to pray for people is to love people. To pray for them is to love them. Pray for the change in the ones you love. And pray enough even, not just because you love them, but pray also to be free. There's a freedom that comes as we pray and as we go to prayer. Because as you're laying those things out, I will tell you there's a freedom to be vulnerable in prayer. Go read the Psalms. Some of you, are, some of you have been going with us through the Psalms you know, during this pandemic. One a day, it's been so encouraging for our hearts. But have you ever wondered, you know, like, you're like, this is, a lot of these Psalms are kind of like complaining right? Like David and Asaph and, and, and the sons of Korah and all these psalmists, man, they got some serious problems. They're a bunch of whiners and they complain about other people sometimes. And these are the worship songs we're supposed to sing? And these are our, this is our prayer book? Like this is our example? Yes. Because as we unburden those things before the Lord, as we bring, Paul is probably concerned with the Philippians and he was probably annoyed at times and frustrated at times and feeling angry at times but he would call out to the Lord he would bring that to the Lord and as we bring those things we can release those things to the Lord in prayer and see in prayer we release the negative things that are within our hearts we get them out of our hearts and we give them to the Lord and lay them at his feet now some of us feel like he's too holy for that and we've got to be all good and God can't handle my sin Wait, did you just hear what I just said? Did you just hear what we believe so many times? God can't handle my sin? Was not the cross of Christ enough? Was not the work of Jesus enough? If God couldn't handle our sin, guess what? Jesus would have never come to earth 
dwelt among us and took our sins upon him at the cross. God knows your sins. Lay them at the feet and let them go. Because as we release those things to the Lord, as we release those, those frustrations, those exhaustions before the Lord, we experience that joy once again. We can have more joy, and, and the ability to love that person increases. The ability to find joy in that, relief, in that relationship increases as we f uh, lay that down before the Lord. But in prayer also, we fight for the good of the other people. We fight for their good as we labor before them. So I call you, like Paul said, man, I, uh, and it is my prayer. This is what I am praying for you. I have been praying, I continue to pray, and this is it, Philippians. Continue to pray. Pray for the change in the ones you love. Now you say, well, what, what should I pray? I'll tell you, Paul's prayer is like awesome. Paul's prayer is perfect. Paul's prayer is beautiful, not only because it was inspired by the Holy Spirit and it's scripture and God knows what he's doing and so he's perfect and everything's good, all right? Not because of all of that, but Paul's prayer is beautiful and perfect because it leads us to the very essentials of life. And that end is our joy in him. And at that end is the people that we're praying for, their joy in Jesus as well. So pray, uh, pray for these things. Here's, here's the first one. Pray for a greater love. Pray for greater love in their lives, right? Moms, as you pray for your kids, do you pray for a greater love in their heart? A greater love for, for Jesus, a greater love for their siblings, a greater love for their parents, a greater love for their neighbor, a greater love for the poor and the oppressed, a greater love for the, those who are downtrodden in society, a greater love for their neighbors at school, their schoolmates, their friends. Do you pray for a greater love? Look what Paul said. He said, and this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent. God is, or, or Paul is praying that God would bring love into their lives so that they would love more and more and more, that they would overflow with this love. Now you may be saying, what kind of love is it? Is Paul praying for them to have great romantic lives? You know, like all the Philippians who are married, he's like, I'm praying that they've got some great love life going on, man. You know, Valentine's Day is coming up, you know, and, and, and they just need to pray. For more love, right? No, that's not what he's praying for. He's not praying for better friendships or better. He's praying for, for benevolent love, committed love. He is praying for sacrificial love, the love that is found in the character and the nature of our God. He's praying for them to have agape love. You say, what is agape love? We'll put the definition on the screen here. It, it, agape love is a divinely empowered directed affection that unconditionally seeks another's highest good. Can I say that again? Agape love, benevolent love, God's love, is a divinely empowered, um, in the sense that it's divinely empowered, this is actually a fruit of the Spirit of God, Galatians 5. So you cannot produce this alone in your life right? You might work at it, you might try it, but all your motives, all your, it'll, it'll, it'll mess it up. You'll be riddled with self, you'll, you'll, you'll get it wrong. Like this is a divinely empowered, and, and we need God's strength for this. But it is a directed affection. Do you know the difference between emotion and affection? The, the, the difference between emotion and affection, emotion is the feeling that comes, you know, it's, it, it's physical, it's, it, 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 it is somewhat mental in a, in a state, but it, but it just comes by the circumstance, and it, and it can be as quick, quick as it comes, as quick as it goes, but, but affection remains. Rem affections are deeper. Affections are the values that we have, the desires that we have that are trained and chosen and that are based on our faith in our best places. Do you have, do you have a deep-seated affection for that person? Because, can, can I tell you, I love my wife. <laughs> she loves me. But every, every once in a while, we just don't feel it. We don't feel the all lovey-dovey, right? 
I don't feel like I love my wife 24-7, 365. I don't. It just doesn't happen. My wife doesn't feel that for me. Like, probably even more, right? Because we talked about that earlier. But here's the reality. It is a directed affection that says, I love you. And I'm choosing to love you because God has loved me and he's given me a greater love. So therefore, my desire is, is for you. My desire is for your good. My desire is to, to bless and to honor the Lord and to serve the Lord. So therefore, I'm going to treat you in a totally different way. And that comes with emotions at times. That births emotions at times and deep connection at times. It's a divinely empowered, directed affection that unconditionally seeks another's highest good. No matter the circumstances, I'm going, what is the best for this person, right? Now, we've just got to say, like, we don't always do that. I don't always do that. I know you sitting at home, you don't, you don't always do that, right? You do not always accomplish this, but, but it's great to be praying for greater love. It is great to be praying that in the lives of those who are in your life as well. Pray for more love, right? Pray for the, uh, more love. Paul was saying that their love would abound, right? Literally, the idea is like overflowing, like a fountain and a pool that is just overflowing. I think of like Jesus when he like multiplied loaves and fish. Can you remember the story of how like some kid brings up a couple loaves and a couple fish and, and Jesus is like, oh, that's no problem. I'll pray and, and, and God's just going to do a miracle. And boom, right? There's like fish and loaves and they're passing it out to thousands upon thousands upon thousands. And it's just overflowing. And every time they reach in, there's more, there's more, there's more. And that's what Paul's praying that abounding sense, right? He wants them to experience the love of God, right? And to abound in this love like a spring that is feeding a well that never runs dry. Any of you ever gone to a Niagara Falls? I love Niagara Falls. There's so much beauty there. There's so much power there. There's so much majesty there. And, and it gives me a sense of, of the glory of God when I'm there and see it. But I, I, so I'm at Niagara Falls, right? And, and you remember your, if you're there too, right? And, and have you ever sat there just in awe of the falls and hearing the thundering? And then have you ever gone, uh, gotten afraid going, oh, I wonder if there's going to be enough water for the falls? Or, or when you were traveling there and driving there with your kids, we're going to go visit the falls. It's going to be great, kids. Come with us. And where you're driving to the falls and you're like, oh, what if the falls run dry? Like nobody ever thinks that, right? Just to see the falls. It's like it's never ending. There's an eternal supply. And, and that's what it is for the Lord. But to have this love and to abound in love, I need to connect to that source. And so I pray that that source of God, they would get connected to God, that they would experience his love for them. They would know his love for them. They would feel his love for them in their lives, right? The mo think of the most unloving person you have in, in your life. They, they seem selfish. They seem arrogant. They aren't concerned about anyone else. They're disconnected and they don't. Pray that they would experience the love of God in a powerful way. And you know what happens at that point? It begins to overflow. The more they experience, the more they sense, the more they know, man, they, it flows out. And that's what Paul's praying. I want you, Lord, to abound in this love. And I pray that not only would they feel it and sense it and experience it, but I pray, God, would you fill them and would you lead them in love? May their lives become more loving as a result. God, pour your love in them, and God, help them to love more. But Paul also prays for a better love, and, that, and that's good to pray as well. Not just for more love, but also a better love. He says that your love may abound with knowledge and all discernment, so that you would approve what is excellent. And I love this, because he's like, um, he's like, they need to know what love is. They have to have the knowledge of God's love. And so Paul's praying that God would teach him that the Holy Spirit who lives within them would, learn, would teach them the love of God so that they would learn what it is and how it, it, how it behaves, what it looks like. And, and Paul's praying for that knowledge. But do you know the difference between knowledge and discernment? Discernment is the ability to take that knowledge and to apply it to take the knowledge that you have and bring it to a certain situation and, and, and apply it and act accordingly to that situation, right? And, and Paul's praying that they would know not just what is love, 
but then that they would know how to love and when to love and why they should love and, and where's the best place to love and all of those, so that they would know the very best things as well. That they would choose those best things in their life and that they would go after the best things in their life and they'd want the best things for those that they encounter as well. So pray for greater love. And I tell you, like, we, we were at the marriage conference that, that uh, was holding, uh, that was held uh, yesterday from 1 to 3. Um, if you didn't have a chance to be there, um, man, you definitely want to see, um, you want to see the recording. I don't know where that is. Rob, where was, where was the recording? Where can they find that? Is it on the Facebook page? Okay. All right. We're going to get that on the Facebook page. So marriage, uh, can I, a link to the marriage conference. You'll be able to see it. So many great ways to love your spouse. So many great principles of how to resolve conflict and how to work through conflict. Talking about scenarios and then so many different ways to, to, to tend the garden of your relationship of love. So good. So helpful. And I'll tell you, my wife and I learned so much. We've needed it because I don't know about you, but we've been around each other quite a bit during this pandemic season, right? And we have, um, we've had a lot of great times together. But at the same time, we've had also some times where all the, all the stuff that's, that, that's kind of at the bottom of our hearts, that, that sometimes we're just so busy we don't deal with, now it's starting to come forth. And now the Lord's bringing it out and going, hey, what about this? And hey, what about this? And hey, what about, man, I need that. I, I'm telling you, man, my wife prays for me to love better to have a greater love. And you know what? I pray for my wife to have a greater love. Why? So that they'll stop annoying me. So she'll stop annoying me and I'll stop annoying her. No, not, not so my life is better, but because I love my wife and I want, I want good for my wife. And I want her to know the joy of the Lord in her life. And that comes as we love more and we love better. Would you pray for those in your life? Moms, would you pray that for your, for your, for your kids? Dads, would you pray that over your household? Man, pray that at work. Pray that in, in, in your communities. Pray that at your schools. Pray that we would love. Pray it as a nation. Man, we need more love. We need better love. Pray for our nation, even. Pray for the change in the ones that you love. Pray for greater love. We need it. Here's another thing Paul prays, and, and it's really the, the last thing that Paul's, Paul's praying. is He's praying for a greater maturity, right? Pray for a greater maturity. Now, I'll tell you, and, and we could probably all admit, this was not on my list. Like, if I was like, hey, what are the great things to pray for? What should I be praying for? Man, I want them to, I want them to be ha healthy. I want them to be wealthy. I want them to be wise. I want them to have all the good things. I want them to laugh tons. I want them to ha be able to play some good games. I want that, you know, I, I'm thinking of all of these fluffy, you know, fluffy, duffy stuff. And Jesus is like, man, they got to love more. They gotta love God, they gotta love others more. And then they need to be more like Jesus. Right? I'll tell you, all of my stuff may lead to a temporary happiness, but these things are leading to the joy of the Lord in their lives. So let's not take Pastor Mike's plan, let's take the Lord's plan. How about that, right? Sound like a good plan? All those in favor, raise your hand. I see you at home. Man, everybody raised their hand. That's the first time we've ever had everyone raise their hand when Pastor Mike said it. It was awesome. Well done. So pray for greater maturity. Look at, uh, look at verse 10 again. Paul says, um, I pray that your love may abound with more knowledge, discernment, to approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Now, Paul is praying for them to be pure, for them to be blameless, for them to bear the fruits of righteousness in their lives that come through Jesus Christ. Man, he is praying for their maturity. He's praying for them to grow up and no longer live like they did before they knew Christ, just as a citizen of this world, but rather to turn to the new gospel reality that they have embraced as they uh, trusted in a new king who can save them and leads them and makes them citizens of a new kingdom. He's like, this is is the way the citizens of this kingdom live. And they need purity. They need blamelessness. They need the fruits of righteousness. And this is awesome. Paul is praying for their purity. And I will tell you, for everybody who grew up in evangelical Christianity, Paul is not praying that they stay sexually pure until they're married. 
That's not what he's praying, right? Because that's what we all think of when we think of purity. We're, we're like, sexual purity, man, that Paul's concerned about. He deals with that in other, other situations, other verses. That's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about is for a true and an honest and an authentic life to come forward. He wants them to be pure in the sense that they're sincere, right? So that there's no more shame in their life that causes them to hide, that causes them to lie, that causes them to put up a face, put up a pretense to say, you know what? This is who I am. It's not the real stuff. I'm not going to let you see all that. This is my nice, pretty, shiny picture. And Paul's like, no, 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 let the guard down. Let the guard down. <laughs> Guess what, everybody? The, the foot of the cross is very level. There's no great, there's no great people in, 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 uh, in the kingdom of God. Can I tell you? There's a, just a bunch of great sinners who got greatly saved by a great God. That's the reality. There's not people who are like, hey, man, look at the cross over here. Well, let's use the cross since it's right here. Hey, man, look at the cross. This is awesome. We, this is awesome, man. Hey, you want some of this? this is, Jesus and I, we're bros, man. Hey, man, you need some of this. You Come grovel, man. You, you, you need to get really low because you're a dirty, rotten sinner. But, man, isn't Jesus awesome? I mean, and I'm his next in line. No, no, no. It's, it's this. Come. Come. And get here. Get before Jesus. Because we need him. Come before the Savior. We need Jesus. We need that purity, that honesty that says, you know what? We're all sinners. We're all broken individuals. And I love it, man. I love as I'm growing older. So, so I'm in my 40s now. And, uh, and, I, and I, <laughs> you get to a place in life where you're just like, yeah. It is what it is, right? It is what it is, you know? And, and, and you're, just, you're just not so ashamed as you once were when you were like, you know, in your teens, in your 20s. You go to school and you're like, oh, I wonder if they like me. I wonder, you know, and you're like, now you're like, eh, if you like me, I don't care, right? I'm showing up. Hope we're having a good time. If you don't like me, guess what? I do, you know? So you're, you're lost, right? And, 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 and there's just a sense of, you know what? The shame's gone. And part of that is, part of that's growing older, but I'll tell you, a lot of it is just going, I have a king who is exposed to every part of my life. He's looked at everything. He's looked at my dirty rap sheet from my past. He knows the sins that I'm committing every single day. He knows the ones that are going to come. And he says, you know what? I love you. You're my kid. Nothing's going to change that. And because of that, I can stand before the Lord and I can go, man, if I can, be, if I can be totally honest to him, that gives me the courage to start being, pray for that for people. Pray that they would be open and pure, free from shame, free from the guile. Maybe, maybe you just need to pray for God to wrestle them, you know? Like, you remember, remember Jacob in the Old Testament? Jacob, Jacob his, his name, I, I feel sorry for anybody who's named Jacob because the name literally means liar. Like every time I meet him, I'm like, huh. So they picked Jacob, huh? Interesting. So what made your parents go with Jacob, <laughs> you know? And I, it's sad because Jacob needed a new name because his name meant liar. The Lord wrestled with him, and then he became more honest. And he became, he get, got a new name, Israel, one who struggles with God. And maybe you need to just pray that for somebody. God, would you wrestle with them? <laughs> God, put them in a chokehold. Put them in a submission hold, Lord. This person needs you, Jesus. They need your joy. They need more of you. Wrestle them. Go get them. You know, like WWF on them, man. Go after them. Come on, right? Pray for them because God needs to wrestle it. Man, if they are in that place, if you know somebody who's like putting up the facade all the time, don't get frustrated that they're putting up a facade. Rather pray for them that God would help them to feel safe enough to let the real self out. Maybe be that safe person, but, but, but more importantly, pray for it. Because their heart needs to see that they're accepted and they're loved by a God who created them. Warts and all, sins and all, and he would forgive it and wash it all away. Be pure. Pray for their pure. Pray for their blamelessness. Pray for their blamelessness. Like, there are no perfect people in this world. 
Can I just, uh, you know, can I do that? You know, some of you are like, well, my mom was pretty perfect, right? And we celebrate, even on Mother's Day, moms, you are awesome, you are amazing. You're not perfect, right? And your kids know it, and I know it, and everybody knows it. So don't try to, to but, but you can be blameless. Blameless is somebody who goes after the sin, goes after the stuff that's in their life and goes, you know what? That person brought something to my life, how I hurt them and wounded them. You know what? I'm going to go back and try and make that right. I'm going to do what it takes to make that thing right. And, and it's somebody who's living in a state where they're like, I'm not harboring sin and hiding sin, but I'm dealing with it and laying it down. Because I'll tell you, man, go, man, as a pastor, I sin regularly. And I've got to confess that to the elders. I've got to confess that to my small group. I've got to confess that to, to my, my accountability partner. I, I, I've got so many people in my life that I confess that to because, you know what? Pastor's a sinner. And you know what? So are you. But here's the thing. So are they. So pray that there would be a blamelessness in their life. Pray that they would long for the things of God. They would love the things of God. And they would want to work on the things that need to be worked. Pray that, man, man, God goes after them, wrestles them so much that after they become more honest, then they start being more uncomfortable with that sin. And they're going, man, they start to hate that sin because they're like, that sin is killing me. And it's killing this relationship, right? Pray for them to grow in that, to grow in purity and blameless. Or Paul also prays this. He prays this. That they might be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. I love this. That they would not only have the righteousness of Christ. When we accepted Christ, when we put our trust in him, we received. God credited our account. He gave us all of the righteousness of Jesus. He covered us with that righteousness. He credited it to our account. And so when he looks at us, he goes, man, I can deal with you because I see my son. And he's given us this sense of perfection before him. And our standing before God, our position before God, is perfect righteousness through Jesus Christ. Now that is a glorious truth of the gospel. And no matter how difficult our lives have been, no matter how, uh, how much of a sinner we've been, we get forgiveness and we get the credited righteousness of God that fulfilled every command of God as written in scripture and according to the character of God. And then what is awesome is that that justification begins to work itself out in our lives. That justification, as we glory in Jesus, as we surrender our lives to Jesus, as we give the Spirit of God control over our lives, we are letting the, 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 the righteous life of Christ live through us. And as we crucified, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And as we surrender our lives, rendering ourselves dead and say, God, live your life through me, that justification begins to work itself out in sanctification. All right? Now, I just gave you a great theology lesson. Some of you are like, what? It's okay. It's okay. You just keep, keep listening. We'll get there together. But here's the truth. Paul was praying that they would, they would experience a changed and a transformed life because of the gospel work in them. Paul was praying for those fruits so that they would live out, they would serve their neighbor. They would begin to love the people in their lives. They'd be filled with peace and with joy and with goodness and with faithfulness and self-control. They would be filled with all of the fruits of the Spirit. They would love their neighbor as themselves. They would look to those who are downtrodden in society and oppressed in society and long for their justice. They, man... These are the fruits of righteousness coming out. Pray for that. God, I pray that your fruit would bear fruit in their lives. Your fruit would burst forth from their lives. But I tell you, you've got to recognize that, uh, that growth takes time. How many have ever tried to pray for somebody and pray, prayed for their change? Like some of you hear this, you're like, pray for change, pray for their change, pray for their change. And you're like, man, that is a frustrating prayer, right? Because it takes so long, doesn't it? I love this quote uh, from, uh, from Richard Foster's book as well. He says this, When we begin praying for others, we soon dis discover that it is easy to become discouraged at the results, which seem frustratingly slow and uneven. 
This is because we are entering the strange mix of divine influence and human anatomy. You see, God never compels in such a way that one is forced into a robotic style of obedience. Even though we would pray for that. We're like, man, God, change them. And what we want them to change is we're like, make them be different immediately, today, different. So they would do stuff different. Force them to it, God, right? He said the aspect of God's character, though, the respect, the courtesy, the patience, man, it's so hard for us to accept but God's way is higher than our way. You see, there's no manipulation, no control, but rather perfect freedom and perfect liberty. This is God's way. And what we're praying for should not be, God, would you change them right now and force them to do what I want them to do? But rather, God, would you be working in their lives? because he will bring things into their lives. Maybe it's a trial, maybe it's a difficulty, maybe it's some discipline that they've needed. God will work in their hearts, but, but will you pray? Will you trust God today to say, God, I, I believe that you can? Will you pray for their maturity? Will you pray for a greater maturity in their life? Why? Not because it impacts us, and, and, and you may have to lay that down. Maybe you have to even confess that just to say, God, I really want them to change right now because, man, I, 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 I'm tired of the way they're acting or I'm tired of the way they treat me or, or it hurts too much or, or I'm feeling so discouraged or when they do this, it just frustrates me to know it. But God, I want to come to you and pray on their behalf for their joy in you. And I know that that comes as they in increase in love as they begin to become a more loving person having experienced your love, and that flows then through a life that is growing more and more like the character of Christ, the most joyful person who ever walked the face of this earth. God, give us your joy and give them your joy. And I pray that they would know that maturity. I pray that the way they would resolve this conflict would be different. I pray that the way that they do life would be so different so that they would know your joy. Pray for the change. Pray for change. You know, I thought about ending with some awesome story, you know, that was heartfelt and just like melt everybody's heart and be like, oh, this would just, oh, we gotta pray right now. But you know what the reality is, is that'll stir us for a moment and then we'll have to deal with real life. And so I would rather just end by saying, who is the Spirit of God right now who is he asking you to pray for? Who is God putting on your heart? Maybe it's an unsaved friend who doesn't, doesn't have a chance of knowing the love of God or experiencing the love of God or even giving the love of God because they just need to know God first. Would you begin to pray for them? Pray for change there. Man, maybe God would wrestle them into, into, into the kingdom. <laughs> or maybe you could pray for your, for your spouse. Man, things have been hard at home. Things have been hard this pandemic, man. We, we've gotten in a lot of fights, and, and, and I don't know that we can still keep staying to get, man, pray. Have you been praying? Or for the kid who's wayward, and you're like, man, will they ever get it, Lord? Would you pray for them? Or maybe the neighbor next to you. Maybe the neighbor that you have, you're like, man, uh, I, I, I just need to ask you, Lord, that they would... They would know more of your love today because they need to grow in love as well. Or maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's, some, maybe it's for not, nothing negative. Maybe it's just that you're like, man, I love, I love my mom today and I'm praying for her joy. I'm praying that she would be so filled with a gladness in you that it overwhelms her heart and warms her heart today. Or maybe you're praying for your grandparents. Or maybe you're praying for, um, for that neighbor who is um, hurt today. Maybe you're praying for that, that loved one who is in the hospital. Maybe, man, just pray for change. Do we need not the power of God in our lives? I need it. So let's pray. Let's do that now. Jesus, we just want to come to you and lay these burdens at your feet, this stuff before you, and say, you are mighty. You are able. Forgive us for taking it back. Forgive us for doing more than we should. 
Forgive us for running into activity as if we were the Savior or we had an ability to affect change. God, you are the change. You are the power. You are the glory. You are the wonderful one that everyone needs to see and know and experience. May we know your joy in you. May they know your joy today. We pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, can we stand and sing together? Can we just lift our hearts once again in worship? our prayer. Jesus, burn within us like a fire so that our prayers would overflow, that they would burn for, for those we love, for those who need more of you in their lives. Prayer is powerful. It is so powerful. And I'll tell you, man, the, the, the prayer of a praying mom is amazing. I'm thankful that I stand here today being able to say I am the result of a praying mom and a praying mother-in-law, and a praying wife who is a mother of my children at home and our children. And man, I am a, I'm blessed with the moms in my life. And, and when they pray, it's powerful. 
If you don't believe me, like I was, I, I even saw this week as I was studying this. In, in, back in 2015, there was a story of a mom who actually prayed for her son and he came back to life. After 15 minutes in the, in, in the water and drowning for 15 minutes and then 30 minutes of CPR and the doctors pronounce him dead going, we don't know what to do. Mom bursts into the room and begins to wail and cry out loudly in the ER for her son and, and he opens his eyes at that very moment. <laughs> and, and the doctors even said, there is no way to describe it other than it is a miracle. Prayer has power. <laughs> and the prayer of a praying mom, a godly mom, has a lot of power. So pray. Pray for the people you love. Pray for the people in your life. Even if you're not a mom, which most of us aren't, pray because we can know the joy of the Lord and, 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 and how good is the joy of the Lord. We need that in our lives. So be, be praying for that change. Hey, we'd love to uh, connect with you after the service. If you need prayer, if you need uh, ministry, the Elders Cafe is going to be opening up. Or Man, just say hi afterwards. Don't leave too soon. Connect with us uh, online and connect with us virtually in our virtual Graces Cafe. And uh, we'd love to uh, say hi and, and just connect before you uh, go off to your Mother's Day celebrations. But before we end, just say another happy Mother's Day, moms. Love you guys. Have a great day. Make sure you tell your mom you love her and uh, give her a big hug. Be strong in his grace and have a great week.